the thing to remember is, and the point I make to it is like, he's been charged 91 felony counts in four different cases. Any combination, uh, a conviction on any combination of those counts virtually could put him in jail the rest of his life. They don't have to win. They don't have to go 91 for 91, these prosecutors. Hello, everyone, and welcome to George Conway Explains It All to Sarah. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and because I am not a lawyer, I have asked my good friend George Conway from the Society for the Rule of Law to explain the legal news to me, and we bring it to you roughly every week. How are you doing, George? I'm good. How are you? Uh, it's very nice to be in person. Yeah, absolutely. Do we you should... ever read the comments on YouTube? No. Should I? I don't. Well, they're just all about how handsome you are. Yeah. Mm. You. And I'm always like, I'm right here, guys. Just sitting right here. Yeah. You know? Look, we all would dress similarly today. <laughs> yes! I don't know who that's bad for. Uh, yeah, I don't okay. know. Okay. Whatever. So here's the deal. Okay, the deal. We are recording this on Wednesday, which means it is the day after the New Hampshire primary. Yes. And so I'm f politics are on my mind. I know we have to talk about like real legal stuff, politics. but the politics are on Doesn't my that mind. That sounds like a good song. Politics on my mind. What is it? Georgia on my mind? Yeah, something like that. Like that. Uh, New Hampshire okay. on my mind. Okay. New Hampshire is on my mind. All right. Um, but also, so Ron DeSantis dropped out of the Republican primary over the weekend. Ron who? Yeah, I know. He's already, you've already forgotten about him, right? Ron what? Uh, oh, okay. Long gone. Long gone. But it's I, wild. I don't think he was, I don't think, how he, is it technically possible to drop out of something you never really were in? Well, this is, so this is what I want to talk about. So do you, I don't know if you remember this, but I was doing focus groups at the end of 2022 and early 2023. Can you imagine wearing those boots? No. And and then just not getting any delegates. Well, did you see there's a video? And not even making it to the, making it, not even making it to, through the first primary? Sad. Well, he made I feel it. bad for him. He got no, I don't. It. Uh, but the number of people who were Ron DeSantis curious in the beginning of 2023, like he was the obvious front runner, so much so that I think lots of people didn't run because yeah. they were like Ron DeSantis. Is oh gonna no, be they were the treating guy. him as like he was he was, he he was the next the coming of the the next the, he was gonna knock everybody out the young guy and yeah strapping young ass kicking guy from florida that's right I, I, I mean i have a close friend who was like big buddies with desantis and is always talking how great desantis was and and my reaction to him was and this is even before i knew how bad a politician desantis mm -hmm. was was unless you have a one-on-one -on -one race against donald trump and you're willing to go at him hammer and tong it's a pointless exercise yeah and even if you go after him hammer and tong you might not win anyway because people don't want to admit that they were wrong and they want to double down. A lot of them want to double down on Trump. And even if you win the nomination, it's not like Trump's just going to go away and say, congratulations, the best man won. I endorse you and I urge all of my supporters to go out and vote for you. I mean, if Nikki Haley runs away with a majority of the delegates, do you think he's going to say, I'm not going to call you. I'm sorry for calling you bird brain. Yeah. I support you. It's a it's a lose lose proposition for anybody to to have run against. This was him. always my argument about why it would be Trump yeah. is that the party was eventually going to realize he could walk with not half the party but with like a solid thirty five no. percent that would follow him right. anywhere and so and and he would just burn the whole thing down because he doesn't care about he, he doesn't and that's he part of his that's party. actually been part of his power over totally. the Republican power of the Republican Party for the last several years yeah. They know they, he, he, they know he, he's willing to torch the place down. Yes. Absolutely. So they have to be nice to him. But here's the thing that was interesting to me about when DeSantis dropped out, suddenly there was a bunch of, you know, uh, there are a lot of the anti-antis, as we like to call mm -hmm. them, in the commentariat. Mm -hmm. They were blaming. I think there are anti-anti-anti-antis, and they're the worst. I, it's, yeah, it's tough to, it's tough to follow that. Yeah. But they are, the, there, there was this line of thinking that it wasn't DeSantis's fault. It was Alvin Bragg's fault that that was when DeSantis started dropping like a stone because Trump got indicted in the first, uh, in the, the Stormy Daniels case. And it had this effect of, like the rally around Trump effect happened. And 
And DeSantis sort of said this too. He tried to make this as an excuse, that it was the legal cases. It was the fact that Trump was being indicted that was leading to nobody else being able to sort of get anywhere with this. Do you think? No. <laughs> you don't think? Please tell me why. I think. No, I think, and yeah. I think not. I mean, yeah. I don't, I just don't. I think the problem was they saw Ron DeSantis. And I think the problem was that all of these people decided to attack each other instead of Donald Trump. I mean, that, this has always been the prisoner's dilemma problem of the Republican Party over the last Nobody actually wants to go out and tell the truth about this guy because they don't want to be out there standing alone when all the other people around them chicken out. Yes. I mean, you, you, have to have, you have to have a pact where everybody goes in and, in and does it all together. But they're not capable of doing that because they can't, they're not trustworthy. They can't trust each other. And the other problem is, you know, we have the same dynamic as we were just talking about, that, that there were so many alternatives to Trump that all he had to do was sit back and let the, they did exactly what they did to each other. Uh, a different group did to each other in 2016. It was a demolition derby and everybody and, and Trump gets a pass. And Trump even Trump even engineered it by not showing up to any of these debates. Um, there was no, re you know, it was actually, I mean, I would have advised them not to show up to any of the debates. Let them let them all trash each other. You know, that's what's crazy. It actually seems like Trump learned a lot from 2016, like that he didn't need to show up to the right. debates. But well, the he, needed, he needed to show up in the debates in 2016 but because he, knew he, he didn't was there. this time. The, of course. Right? He right. knew that he could, that, that they could stand there and drive Correct. up each other's negatives. It didn't seem like the other candidates learned anything, though. No, they didn't learn anything. But because why? because they all wanted to be the alternative to Trump. Right. And that's what happened last time is, you know, Trump got ahead a little bit and then everybody just sort of like, they wanted to make it a one-on-one, -on -one, and the problem was it never became a one-on-one -on -one quickly enough. Now it is a one-on-one -on -one before before uh, Super Tuesday, unlike what happened eight years ago. Um, but he's he, he's he's got he's got so much of the base locked in already that he didn't have that in 2016. So it's not you know they, they needed to do this earlier. They needed to they needed to eliminate each other earlier, and they needed to go in at him like, you know, Christie did all at once. And they just never did that. And I think even if they had done that, I think there's just a ceiling to what they could have accomplished because these people out there don't want to admit they're wrong. And also there was this article, I'm sure you saw it in Politico by Michael Cruz just the other day about how this, interviewing one voter and this one voter who was ex uh, a, a, a military colonel I was it I think Marine Corps or Army I don't remember and he's a well reasonably well off GOP voter in New Hampshire and basically the upshot is he wants to destroy the country yeah it's like burn it all down <laughs> burn it burn all down and yeah. the, and you know and Trump is the right candidate for that I mean his yeah. view is I mean the, it, it is a very nihilistic uh, mentality it's just like he doesn't like it's, there's nothing in particular that he gets that upset about. I mean, maybe immigration, maybe this, but he's really just mad at the forces that he think, thinks controls the country, that control the country. And he wants to take those people down and he doesn't care. I mean, he basically admitted he doesn't care if that hurts him at the same time. I mean, it's just, it's just inconceivable to me that, that, they're, that, that people can think that way. I don't do a lot of comic book references, but, you know, Bane in the Batman movies. Uh, yeah. Is it Bane? Is that who I mean? Uh, who just says some people just like to watch the world burn? Yeah. About the Joker? Yeah. Uh, that, that, feels, yeah. that feels right. And this idea that people are just, and I hear this in the focus groups all the time where you say, like, well, how, are th how do you think things are going in the country? And it's not that they're, eh, wrong track or I don't like it. It's like, we're losing the country. The country's over. Right. It is the level of catastrophizing. Yeah. And then you look around and you think, stock market all time stock high. Yeah. The economy no. is bouncing back. We've moved on from COVID. Like, is it? I mean, everybody, everybody, in the, and 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 has a cell phone. Everybody has. I mean, we we've never. I mean, you don't hear about the. Well, we don't. People don't want to launch another war on poverty like they did in the '60s because we don't have as much of it. We mm. just don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we just, people are pretty well off in this country. We, we compared, and if you look back at human history, we have it 
as good as anybody has ever had it in terms of material wealth. I just think people are just, I mean, I, I, maybe Tom, that's the problem. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, Tom Nichols point is like, everybody's bored. Yeah. And, and it's not an exciting life to, you know, watch TV, go home, go to work in the morning, watch, go home, watch TV, um, watch Fox News. And, and, but Fox News gives everybody, I guess, some kind of outlet where they can feel like we're in a battle with somebody. And that's exciting. It gets the people's juices flowing. So, All know. right. So I want to get... Th- the, the whole thing with DeSantis and the idea of that somehow Alvin Bragg was the cause and not his catastrophic mm-hmm. candidacy and or bad strategy, uh, it got me thinking about the election going forward yeah. and how the criminal trials are going to impact it. Because, uh, you know, in focus groups with two-time Trump voters, a lot of people said, like, a conviction isn't going to change how they think about Trump. Um, and some of them, the ones who really love him, said it made them want to vote for him even more. Uh, so in terms of perception with his base. Criminal convictions don't hurt Trump at all and might help him, but criminal convictions aren't just about perceptions. They have real consequences. Yeah. Like prison. Prison. Potentially. Uh, So first I want to ask you, what is Trump's 30,000 foot strategy for the criminal stuff? Is he trying to run out the clock in hopes of being president again before he's convicted of anything? Like big picture. Well, Trump is not a strategizer. I mean, the point I've been trying to make to a lot of people is there is no, he personally doesn't have a strategy, okay? Because he is a short-term thinker, he's a sociopath, he's impulsive, um, but you know he has certain instincts that come into play, and one of the instincts is if something, you put off something bad and delay, and, and that's something he's learned in, do, in engaging in decades of litigation, uh, mostly against him, but also he, he just, he wants to basically freeze everything and 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 then and but also play the victim at the same time and those you know those are just instincts i don't think there's there there's i don't think there's much of a strategy there because if he had actually been thinking about what he was doing when he does things he wouldn't have taken the sto- the documents to mar a lago he wouldn't he would have just given them back he's not capable of thinking more than a step ahead and, but I think that what, what he is capable of doing is he understands that he doesn't want to be convicted, and he understands that if he's president again, um, the convictions may not stand, or at least they, they, the, the sentences could not be enforced against him, at least while he is sitting in the, in the Oval Office. Okay. So there's going to be four criminal trials against Trump this year, right? Yeah, well, uh, four are scheduled currently scheduled. Whether they all go off is a, a fair question, but yes. All right, let me see if I can get through that. So one is the D.C. election interference case, which is Jack Smith's case. Federal. That's a federal case. Mm-hmm. Right. One is the Florida, like you just mentioned, the confidential documents case, which is also by Jack Smith, also a federal case. Correct. Jack Smith is very busy. He is a very busy man, yes. I had not quite realized he was doing both. <laughs> I had yes. Not, okay. He's, uh, a, he's a very special, special counsel. Okay. And then one is the hush money case in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's which the is Alvin the, Bragg case. Right. Uh, New York State case. And then one is the Georgia Rico case. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm going to probably ask you to do a deep dive into all these cases all right. as those trials get going. But for now, let me just ask you about the trial timeline. So which trial is going to go first? And how does that get decided? Well, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but D.C. election interference trial is scheduled to go on March 4th. I don't think that's necessarily going to happen because of the delay that has been caused by Trump's assertion of presidential immunity. And I think we talked about in a prior episode how that was argued in the D.C. circuit now two weeks ago. Um, I think there will, you know, it's, poss- it's possible that the, if the decision comes down this week, the trial could occur in March or maybe early April. Uh, it could get delayed further, though, if Trump is successful in, he's going to lose in the D.C. circuit, I'm pretty confident based on the argument. Uh, it could get delayed further if Trump tries to take it to the Supreme Court, which he absolutely will try. And the question is whether the Supreme Court will bother to take it. And if they do, then they in all likelihood, decide the immunity issue, which isn't a hard issue to my mind, uh, by June. And then you'd end up with a trial probably, my guess would be August. Um, I don't remember what the trial date is for the Florida um, 
documents case, but you just get the feeling that the, the judge is putting that on a slow boat and she hasn't postponed the trial date. I, I think it's sometime in the summer. Um, but you just get the feeling she's not all that anxious to push the case and she's, she's doing things that people read as potentially slowing the case down, but we'll see. Um, the Bragg case, I think, is sometime in April. But I, but I, I you know, and then the, then the question is, you know, is, is that going to interfere with any of the other cases? And it may or may not, depending on what happens in the D.C. in in the D.C. Circuit with the immunity case and the Georgia case. Uh, you know, it, it's also scheduled to go sometime this year, but the, it's a very um, that's a much more complicated case. And so it's not clear that that's going to happen. Because it's a Rico case. Because it involves so many defendants, although quite a number of them have have pleaded. And, you know, they're working on delay, trying to to delay that. Um, And there's this little controversy that that Fonnie Willis uh, stepped into with with hiring her boyfriend to be a prosecutor in that case, which wasn't a good idea. Side note, can we talk about that really quickly? Why, why, why would one do that? Uh, I mean, look, I- I, I, Love? well, I, you know, I don't think he, you know, I don't think it was a thing where he, she's trying to reward him and I'm just guessing I'm done to, for, for his love, shall we say. Yeah. I think that, you know, I think that she, she wanted some, my guess is she wanted somebody she could trust and she felt close to this man and can, and, and can trust him and that he's a good lawyer. Problem is, um, it looks bad. The other problem is he's not really, doesn't really have a prosecutorial pedigree. He's a good, a very you know, good civil lawyer. And he's done, from what I can tell from what he's done, from the work that they produced, in, especially, including and especially the, 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 the extensive indictment, um, they, they're doing a good job and nobody has said he's not. Um, but that said, it's, it, it looks bad um, because it looks like you're, you know, you're high, it's nepotism. I mean, you know, far be it for Donald Trump to, 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 to be critical of that, but he will. And, um, but I don't think anything, I mean, these all raise issues about public administration and about um, the ethics of maintaining, uh, you know, not, not engaging in mixing personal and professional, but it's got nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of the defendants. And I don't, I, nobody that I have talked to can see how it can possibly help the defendants legally. It may help them politically in some sense because it gives them something to bash Fonnie Willis with. But on the other hand, I mean, it, it, this thing could, could just go away because it, you know, it, it, it's not clear that it's even relevant to the divorce case that, that Wade is involved with because that, that, there's, also, there's an agreement already he had with his ex-spouse. They've been separated for three years. And I, you know, it's just un, unclear why all of a sudden this got resurrected or got, you know, put on the radar screen. Other than, um, I don't know, other than politics. Knowing nothing about it, other than really what you just told me and what I've read, I do it drives me crazy when people just got a big, no, you big got, right. job, a you, big important absolutely. thing to do, and the why public, you muck it up with something that's trust yeah, exactly. is deeply important right. in this yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, all right, but back to the back to the calendar you were just doing. If I heard you correctly, it sounded like the most the case most likely to move is the Alvin Bragg case, which I don't even think you're gonna have discussed that. Would would you agree that that's the weakest from a the yeah. offense is just kind of like everyone's like okay, the guy paid it, off a porn star. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a crime. It's just not. It doesn't have as much oomph as some of the other offenses, like stealing classified documents containing nuclear secrets and trying to overthrow the Constitution of the United States. It looks pretty trivial. Those are bad. Yeah, those are bad. Those yeah. are bad in my book. Um, but paying the, you know, the, the paying off a porn star. I mean, that w- and and then creating false books and records. I mean, that is a crime under New York law. I mean, you you are not allowed to create false books and records, even if you are, have a privately owned family company. You're not allowed to do that. Um, and, you know, what, what happened here was it was, it, you know, it, 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 they created false records in the books of the Trump Corporation, but it was also an effort to cover up from the public you know, <laughs> what, what, what this man was about. So yeah. it was, in a sense, a kind of a, 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 a low-level election interference case, you could call it that. But it's just does, it pales in comparison to the other stuff. I mean, it is something, though, that the Justice Department should, to my mind, should have brought on January 21, 
2021, um, but they did not. Um, they brought, you know, they brought a case against, um, once upon a time, they brought a case against John Edwards. John Edwards had um, a baby and a baby mama, and he got some old lady donor to give money to support the baby mama. And he was prosecuted for that. Now, he was yeah. acquitted, but people say that he was acquitted because the, the old lady who gave the money was so old she couldn't testify, and they really, there were gaps of proof. But the fact is, you know, it charged, they charged a crime mm-hmm. because you're not allowed to, you know, you're not allowed to create, in, in that case, that was, a, that was a federal election. Those were donations to the campaign because they were done for purposes of advancing his candidacy or preventing something from derailing his candidacy. And you could make that same, you know, and that, that same argument um, could have been made about Trump. Okay, so, but again, so just on the timeline, it doesn't sound like there would be a conviction in anything before the convention in July. I, I'm not, I'm not certain of that. I think it's possible. I could, I could work out a timeline for the election interference case in D.C. Uh-huh. Right, that that would get that case to trial before the before the conventions. Okay, tell me what that would be. Okay, that would be it would be that um, this afternoon. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit will, just hypothetically, aff- affirm Judge Chutkin's denial of Trump's motion to dismiss on grounds of presidential right. immunity. They could then say that the mandate, which is the order that they issue saying this judgment um, shall take effect immediately, um, they could issue a man, uh, an order saying that the, you know, the, this, this, the judgment is affirmed and the mandate shall issue immediately. In which case, that would lift the stay of proceedings in the district court and ca- cause things to happen, like you know all the pretrial appeal stuff. But he could to the Supreme Court. Like well, he said. could, he could. But here, here's the rub: is yeah. that in he he wants to stop the proceedings in the district court, right? And if the D.C. Circuit issues a mandate saying that the judgment is affirmed and essentially lifts the stay, they're off to the races in the district court unless. Trump goes somewhere and gets someone else to stop it. And he could, there is two places he can go. One is to the full D.C. Circuit on Bonk. On Bonk. On Bonk, yes. And and the other is to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, If he, you know, if he, he could, he could easily lose those stay applications. I think what would happen most likely is that the the Supreme Court would enter a stay or maybe the, even the D.C. Circuit could enter a stay until the disposition of a petition for certiorari if the, if the petition is filed by X date, which is what happened essentially in the Colorado case, which forced Trump to file a quick uh, cert petition to the Supreme Court, which is why that case is moving like the speed of light. That same thing could happen in the immunity case. And if the court were to deny cert, you could see basically trial proceedings recommencing, assuming that the D.C. Circuit ruled today, in a couple of weeks or three mm. weeks. And if that were true, uh, then you'd probably get another month of delay for, the, for, the, for basically to make up for January and part of December. And the case could get tried in May or June. Okay. In, or April, April, May or June. So I, I think it's possible. I, I, I don't think we know. For, it really depends on how quickly the D.C. Circuit rules and uh, I actually would have thought they would have ruled by now or they could rule any day now. Um, and whether the Supreme Court wants to take the case, mm-hmm. that's fundamentally two things. But the one thing the Supreme Court cannot do because it would get roasted, it would be to take the case on some kind of a slow track such, such that it would be argued in the fall, in which case you'd never get a trial before the election. Yeah, That's just not going to happen because if they, they're going to understand like th- there's a, there's a, there's a fire that's going on in the district court. This thing is ready for trial, and they're not, you know, they don't want to look, they certainly don't want to look like they're trying to delay things for, for Trump. So I guess, well, but what if, what if they take the, I've always wondered this, what if they take the opposite view, which is not that it, delaying it makes it look like they're helping Trump, but that they decide to delay it because they think we cannot rule on this before an election because we don't want to interfere. Yeah, they can't do that. That, no. that would that would be they, they, their their job is to decide cases, and okay. they're gonna they're not going to they're not going to put this off. I, I just can't. It's just inconceivable to me that they would do that. And, and I think the perfect example of that is illust- I mean, it's illustrated by the Fourteenth Amendment case, which is going to be argued on February eighth. Now that said, I mean, the Fourteenth Amendment case is a little different 
this disqualification case is different because the argument for expedition is that state election officials need to know the answer to this question because they're printing ballots. Yeah, right. And and they're printing ballots for Super Tuesday, although I don't know whether the, this decision is going to be able to affect that, but there are still going to be some primaries left over going into April um, and no, they, they need, and we need res- resolution for the fall since he probably is going to be the Republican nominee, almost certainly going to be the Republican well, nominee. Certainly going to be. I mean, unless, literally, unless a health event, I think, barring yes. a health event. But you just said something that I don't know why this keeps reoccurring to me. Mm. But that is four criminal cases, two civil cases, and then there's also the cases of like, can he be on the ballot or not? Yeah, well, but I mean, the civil we, cases, which civil cases are you thinking of? You think of EG and Carol, Carol and which and other one? And the Trump organization. Yeah, but there's another one too. What's the other one? There is a case in, called ACN, and ACN was this multi-level marketing scheme. Like Trump that, University? It, basically, what it was is they, it was advertised on The Apprentice, <laughs> and you basically you send in money, and then they, 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 they're supposed to teach you how to get money, um, make money. Yeah. Um, but the way they make money is they just keep getting, they just keep taking the money. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, like a chain letter. And so um, that was a fraud. Mm-hmm. And the same lawyer who is who, who brought the um, E. Jean Carroll case, my friend Robbie Kaplan, is the plaintiff's lawyer in that case. It's Why is very that just case. happening now? Because it it's just, you know, litigation takes a long time. This case was this, this case was brought in, I think, 2018. It was brought before. 2017 or 2018, because it was brought b- before the E. Jean Carroll story came out, and that's actually how it's actually how I met uh, Robbie Kaplan. Uh, I, I saw the complaint in this. It was a RICO. It was originally charged as a RICO case, or uh, alleged as a, a RICO case, and um, I was very impressed with the complaint. And I then went back and I looked at the various news articles that were written about it. And so, the life, for the life of me, I don't understand why. Federal prosecutors didn't get involved in that one. Hmm. So, I mean, right. it's, so just a, it was just out, it's just outright fraud. Three civil, four criminal, and one that I'll call procedural. Per, well, do, uh, it, yeah, it's it, yeah, it not li- it's not for liability, but it's for the, all the marbles, you know, whether he gets to be on the. the and ballot. then they have these like tentacles of like the immunity and all these other things that end up in their own. You can forgive voters for feeling like the legal stuff is white noise. Yeah, because it's just there's just so much of it. It's overwhelming. So much. Uh, and the, one of the things you said this earlier, and it struck but the, me. The thing to remember is, and the point I make to it is like, he's been charged with 91 felony counts in four different cases. Any combination, uh, a conviction on any combination of those counts virtually could put him in jail the rest of his life. They don't have to win. They don't have to go 91 for 91, these prosecutors. Not the Alvin Bragg case, though. Uh, there's, there's a, there's a Would potential. Would he go to jail for that? Is potentially, yes. Okay. Well, then what happens if he goes to jail or what happens if he's convicted, given a sentence of jail time and he's president of the United States? Um, the sentence would not be, I, I don't think you could execute the sentence. I don't think you could, you could put him in jail. I, I mean, the, the, there's a history here of, there are these memos written by the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, which is basically the, the legal th- brains of the Justice Department where they think about hard issues and they give advice to the president and give advice to other people in the executive branch. And in the Nixon administration, the question came up, could a president be indicted? And also it came up in the Clinton administration. And both the Nixon and Clinton administration Justice Departments wrote memos saying, no, you can't. And the argument is that you, 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 can't, you can't criminally prosecute the president of the United States because you can't prevent him from being president. The proper remedy is to impeach and remove him, and then you can prosecute him. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not sure that's completely correct um, because I think you, you know, just in the same way that you can bring civil cases that was shown by the Paula Jones case against the president if they don't have um, sufficient connection to his office, um, I, I don't know why you can't actually bring a criminal case, but I think it's pretty clear. I, I don't. I don't. I think it's pretty clear you couldn't incarcerate him because if you incarcerated him, uh, either pre-trial or after a sentencing, after after a jury a conviction, 
uh, you would prevent him from doing his job. And, and that's, you know, that would violate Article 2 of the Constitution. So I think he's got a pretty good argument that it, even if he were in lockup, a federal or state lockup on January 20th at, in, for breakfast, um, if he won the election, he'd have to be sprung at noon. That's why he's running, right? Of course it is. Yeah. And in fact, in fact, Maggie Haberman reported a few times in 2019 and 2020 that one of the reasons why he, was, he ran for re-election was because he wanted to make sure that nobody could prosecute him. Yeah. I mean, this is a man who would never admit his guilt, but knows that he's at risk. He's always known that he has risk. And this, and this goes back to, I mean, I, the thing, a story that haunts me is about two days before the inauguration, I was on a plane. Um, it was the Trump plane. And there were four people in the cabin. There was the president-elect of the United States, Hope Hicks, my then wife, and me. And we're just sitting, like, I was sitting about this far from the president-elect, and he asked me this question. He goes, should I fire the U.S. attorney of the Southern District of New York, replace him, who is pre-Bara? And my answer was, well, I mean, generally speaking, it's better to have your people in positions of power than not. I mean, I just was giving just a generic answer. We want people who are going to be, you know, if, if, you, if you have some kind of a priority, um, and, and I'm thinking here of a prosecutorial priority of, of, of some sort, like a legitimate one, I guess, you know, it would, be, it would be better to have your own person in there. Although I didn't elaborate on this. I mean, the, the practice is mixed on whether or not people stay on from administration to administration in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And there's a special kind of aspect to the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York is that it considers itself kind of independent of everybody and independent of the Justice Department. They, the joke in the Justice Department I learned when I was um, contemplating going into the Justice Department in 2017 was they call it the Sovereign District of New York. Mm -hmm. But that said, I mean, it, there, there have been lots of circumstances where new presidents replace U.S. attorneys, not because they think they're going to be charged in any particular district. But in this case, years later, I realized this guy had something on his mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why did he care so much about that, about that district? Other, you know, it wasn't just, you know, hometown. Did he fire Preet? Yeah. I forgot about that. He did. The first Ooh. podcast, one of the first podcasts I ever did was with Preet. Did you tell him that story? Absolutely, I did. Oh, yeah. Uh, was he mad at you? No. No. <laughs> well, I, mean, he un I mean, he understood why I said what I said. I'm yeah. just, you know, I, I didn't say he should fire him. Sure. I just said all of the things, you know, I, I, I did it the way the economists do, ceteris paribus. I said all of the things being equal. Yeah. Yeah, you'd all of the things being equal, you'd rather have, have your own person somewhere important. I would spend the rest of I mean, the time talking about just what else happened on that plane. Uh, I don't. That's the only thing I remember. Yeah. That's the only thing I remember. Hmm. The only other thing I remember, I mean, the rest of it was just, I, I don't know whether there was much talking. I remember, you know, taking a selfie and, you know, the kind of things you do when you're riding on, you know, a big 757 with a guy who's about to be sworn in as president of the United States. Yeah, I don't know. That's never happened to me. No, um, no I don't think it's going to happen. No one invites me on their private It's planes. never going to happen to me again, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, so it was unique. So uh, what's the difference if Trump's convicted in one of the state cases for the federal cases? Does that have any bearing on what we just talked about? No, I don't. I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't think that a state could incarcerate a president of the United States while he is president. Okay. The only difference would be that as president, he can fire the federal prosecutors. He has that power. But I don't think he'd even need to do that. He certainly will, but he can't fire the state prosecutors. But I do think in either situation, if he's incarcerated, found con if he's convicted and incarcerated um, by either state authorities or federal authorities, he, he'd be, they'd have to spring him at noon on January 20th, 2025. Wild. You know, it all feels so unprecedented because we've never had a president try to interfere with the peaceful transfer of power before. Like, we've never had a. He's got 91 have, like, problems. Have this <laughs> yeah. I won't say the rest of but it. But the base ain't one. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I have to keep reminding myself Apologies that it is 
Yeah. Jay Z. I have to keep reminding myself that it is not uncommon for government officials to go Absolutely. to prison. Absolutely. And, and no that, one says we're a we're a banana well, Republican Rod Blagojevich. Yeah. I mean, th- this guy is a re- this guy. Hardened. Yeah. No. This guy is. I mean, I, I made the same point about the Ukraine situation, right? Ukraine. He basically. He's got these federal funds that he is required by law. They have the, 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 the spending authorization has been made and he was required to disperse military aid, security aid to Ukraine. And he held, he, he ordered that it be all held. And he strongly intimated, as we all infamously, and perfect as we know, call. in the perfect phone call, he basically said, look, Hey, listen, you can do me a favor. You know, quid pro quo. And if a, the point I always made about that is if a state official had done that with federal highway funds in order to encourage a prosecution or some kind of a negative action to be taken against a political rival. I mean, this is a hypothetical I would think of. Let's say you're, 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 you're the uh, governor of, Longwell State. Oh, that sounds okay? like a great state. And, the, and in the capital, the capital also named Longwell has a mayor named um, Joe. Oh. And then and the governor um, uh, wants to, it, the, the Joe begun, decides to run for governor and his successor as mayor um, takes over. And the governor then says, I'm not going to give you those highway funds unless you conduct, you announce you're conducting an investigation into bad acts of your predecessor. Same thing. Mm-hmm. That would be- the, That the, would not stand in Longwell, would, it would, state it would of be, Longwell. In the state of Longwell, the U.S. Oh. Attorney for the District of Longwell would, would, would convene a grand jury. And in the, the Longwell Times, and the next morning, they'd be, a, you know, they'd be an investigation, they'd be saying, people have received grand jury subpoenas, the governor, blah, 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 his office, you know, and we'd, and we'd, off, we'd be off to the races like a Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now that I'm telling stupid jokes, it's probably means it's pumped. time to go. Oh, so, I, I had my stupid joke. 91, 91 charges and a something isn't one, you know. The base ain't one. Yeah, uh, base ain't one, okay. So anything yes, we should be looking out for this coming week in the local oh, news? Well, okay, so... Um, what's going on this week is we're waiting the, awaiting the D.C. Circus decision in the immunity case. Um, we are also watching the weird situation in Georgia involving Fonnie Willis. And the E. Jean Carroll trial has been delayed because I mean, nobody knows exactly why, but there was a sick juror who had symptoms of COVID. And nobody has said that anybody has COVID, but... The, the, the supposition is that there's somebody in that courtroom uh, got COVID and that's, you know, but it's been day to day. They've been delaying each day. Um, we're probably going to get kicked over until next week because yeah. I just, you know, I mean, it's like a, the, what the CDC guidelines are like five days or something like that. I don't know. And um, the, the real issue then is that Trump was supposedly going to testify um, this week. Um, he may, supposedly court's going to happen tomorrow if they don't kick it again, and he could testify tomorrow. If he does testify tomorrow, that'll be the last thing that happens this week, and then they'll probably charge the jury Monday or Tuesday, and the jury will get the case Monday or Tuesday. we got to have a verdict Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. If if there's no court tomorrow, then it'll probably get pushed another day, but we'll see. Okay, well... Uh I'll look forward to having you right. explain it all to me then. Yeah, As hopefully always, a week from now we'll have uh, you know we'll have something to talk about. Sounds great, George Conway. Thank you, ma'am. Great to have you here. Always uh, nice to be here. Thanks to all of you for joining us for another episode of George Conway Explains It All. Don't forget to hit subscribe, and we will see you next week. Ooh.